Eugene Farmer, seen as the father of the efficient market hypothesis, further built on original work which was done in the early 1900s. His 1960s uh, PhD thesis has uh, seen many variations to the original theme. Some academics suggest that efficiency can take on a strong, a semi-strong and a weak form. And more recently, behavioral finance specialists have highlighted glaring faults with the efficient market hypothesis. So how efficient are the markets really? And is there something that can be learned from the efficient market hypothesis? And gentlemen, I welcome you once again. I think a definition, of course, is needed. Efficient market hypothesis, something that we talk about and perhaps uh, uh, investors in some way don't really take it that seriously because we always feel that there's a lot of unknowns and we can predict uh, the future. Well, I mean, I think the first thing that Farmer tried to say when he, when he came up with or when he, when he wrote the efficient market hypothesis was that there's an intrinsic value for, 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 any, for any asset out there. And then the other thing for the asset is the actual market value and that those over time should actually be the same because why should there be a gap between these two? And if we all know all the information that is available all the time, then there shouldn't be a glaring difference between these two. Unfortunately, though, is that we've lived through market crashes such as the one we've just gone through, the 08, 09 crisis, the 70s crisis in the US. Yeah, go back to 1929, and you'll see a similar issue there. The question, though, is, does that mean that markets continue to be efficient? Do or you does think that, that they're markets, efficient, right? No, uh, could be? Absolutely not. No. not no. I think markets are inefficient. And maybe let me play devil's advocate here yeah. by saying that depending on where you see the market and through what cycles you see the market, um, in certain cases, the market might prove to efficientness that sometimes it could be efficient, depending just again on the, on the time frame that you're looking at the, at, at the market. In certain cases, it could show how inefficient it can also be. Okay, so Roland, let's get a sense from you. Are markets efficient or not? Most of the recent research, quantitative research, is showing that um, there are discrepancies or inefficiencies in the market, but that they are short-term effects and that in the long run, markets tend to be pretty efficient, as in very efficient. But in the short term, that, that might be Okay, efficient. Rowan, so we've heard from both Kobe and Roland. Your view, we know that there's strong, <coughs> semi-strong and weak efficiency over a long period. It seems that uh, Roland suggests that they are efficient or over a shorter term, perhaps slightly more inefficient. Let me work on the three categories that you gave us. Uh, these are my views. Uh, the weak form of market uh, efficiency is uh, quite simply kind of naively optimistic, in my view. The uh, semi-strong form is implausible, and the strong form is, uh, quite frankly, fanciful. Okay. Uh, I actually <laughs> hope to see the strong form of market efficiency removed from textbooks and the sooner the better. Okay, so well, let's take a look at the strong form of market efficiency. It basically states that all known information is known at a certain period of time, whether it's public or private information, and it's been adjusted in the market performance. When you look at semi-strong information, it's, uh, we see a re-rating, uh, a very uh, quick re-rating within the, the market. And in terms of weak uh, efficiency, it takes into consideration things like technical analysis. So are we saying that markets are not efficient? Is that what you're alluding to? I'm certainly saying the strong form is uh, an embarrassment to the academics. Uh, it was clearly written by somebody uh, with no working knowledge whatsoever of the markets themselves. Um, the semi-strong form <coughs> is, uh, is, is a little bit detached from how things work. Uh, it is inconceivable that everybody comes by the same knowledge at the same time and reacts perfectly as the mm. economists would have us do. In an unbiased fashion, I think that's also In an unbiased fashion. Even, even yeah. more. Well, I, I don't want to be too hard on this. I, I think that the efficient market hypothesis is a wonderful null hypothesis from which we should argue against. The burden on proof falls on us practitioners to show that it, it is uh, not right. But for it to have been right, uh, it, it gives the, yeah. the game away that the yeah. academics hadn't worked in the markets. Okay, so Roland, I mean, you're saying from a quantitative perspective, over the long term, uh, markets are efficient. So perhaps you can tell us why Roland okay. might be getting it wrong and, and uh, for the strong uh, uh, views out there. I think you were saying it's fanciful, so. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I would agree with, with Rowan that the definition of the strong form can be, you know, picked apart in the sense that not all investors are rational and, and um, you know, there are things like um, peop different people have different sort of tax regimes and different time horizons and all of those kind of things. But that does not remove the, f the, the, the fact that um, can you outperform the market? So we're talking about two issues here. The one is about informational 
uh, efficiency in the sense that if new information comes to market, how quickly does the market absorb that information? That's one issue, and that's what Rowan disagrees with, and I agree with him on that, on that front. But can you use that information to outperform uh, the market is a separate question. And the evidence certainly shows that well over um, half, in fact two-thirds or more, of most active fund managers underperform the market in the long run. So th that's um, a different view of, of the, uh, the same debate. Kirby, I'd like for you to get into the degree of certainty. You've got a quite a nice uh, uh a graph for us that basically shows uh, greed and fear and obviously they are in, in very different places and between that you get the likes of ego and caution. Take us through that and how during bubble and during the hype we saw uh, market participants uh, ensuring that there was an explanation for why markets were very strong and why markets were very weak. Now let, me, let me complicate things slightly more by saying uh, that the brain and the stock market are actually conflicting systems. Yeah. The brain is a backward-looking, pattern-seeking system. That means it looks at its immediate past and it tries and extrapolates that into the future, whereas the stock market, for most part, is a forward-looking forward pricing system. So if you have a look at that graph over there, um, you'll see it's an economic cycle, and what I've done is I've, pay, I've taken a whole bunch of emotions emotion into it, yes. and I've put in a whole <laughs> emotion. And the two big ones, and, the two, and they're kind of at, at opposites of the, of, 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 the, of the graph there, is fear and greed. So if you fully in full greed mode. So you believe that the world is roses, there's lots of M&A activity out there, those are mergers and acquisitions, PEs are floating kind of at the 20, 25 levels, everything is just absolutely rosy out there. You'd be sitting with a lot of ego in the system yeah. and your degree of certainty by now trying to predict the future, you'd be using your immediate past and you'd be saying, well look, you know, hang on a second, things could only get even better into the future. And hence, you now use your immediate past by trying to price into the future. But what happens if you're at the bottom of this curve, where you've got such, you know, things such as contempt, or you've got fear, you know, or even capitulation? What, 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 about, what about then? You're now using your immediate past in order to try and understand the future, but it's so tainted by what has just happened to you in the market. Now, this over here, and remember that most humans drive markets. That's what drives the market at the end of the day. So if we've got this behavioral aspect, how can markets really be efficient? We're not efficient as human beings. Why do we expect the markets to be efficient? Of course we're efficient, Kobe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Rowan, I'd like to ask you this. I mean, Kobe was alluding to intrinsic, intrinsic value versus true value, and it seems that, and I'll give you an example, something that really uh, struck out, uh, stuck out for me. Just before the crisis, any uh, corporate that had a lot of cash on their balance sheets were saying, you know, people were saying, well, lazy uh, money, what are they going to be doing with it? Why aren't they putting the money to work? And then during the crisis, the companies that had a lot of cash on their balance sheets were seen to be uh, the, the, the companies that were actually prudent and, and based on those value metrics uh, a lot of investors were making decisions. Are there different ways of measuring value and intrinsic value to be exact that could perhaps make views on the efficient market hypothesis differ from time to time? Yes, absolutely. What uh, Kube has just touched on is really behavioral finance and behavioral finance is um, much younger than the efficient market hypothesis, perhaps about 15 years, and it, uh, it describes that the perfect calculating machine that we used to think human beings were was, uh, was a very flawed model, and markets are subject to, to different behaviors. And therefore, just as beauty is in the eye of the beholder, so uh, fair value or intrinsic value is in the eye of the beholder. And you and I can quite rationally come to different conclusions with the same set of data. And after all, that's what makes markets interesting. And it does lead uh, when people move in, in herds to palpably overpriced or underpriced, or should I say overvalued or undervalued uh, situations. And these have been arising for centuries and will continue to do so. But taking what you've just said um, is going to still not solve the problem of, let's, let's assume markets are driven by greed and fear and that they are mispricings and, and the ability to, to outperform um, by fund managers. The, the, the point still that a lot of people are arguing, and there are people like Stephen Thorley and these kind of um, specialists in the, in the market efficiency uh, group who say, even if markets are inefficient and there are opportunities to exploit, um, can you do that after costs in the long run and given that past performance is no indication of future performance? Those problems don't go away necessarily. Um, the, the, uh, the other sort of issue around that is that we need to... Um, when we, when we decide on, on who we're going to pick to manage, um, we need to know if that person, even if there are opportunities in the market to outperform, whether that person is the right person. So how do we use the fact that markets are inefficient to make money? Okay. 
Let's, let's take the observation made earlier. Lots of fund managers do underperform after fees. Um, the flip side of that is quite a few manage to outperform and, and fairly steadily and for, for long periods of time. Now, I don't want to say that if my view of the efficient market hypothesis is that it's mostly garbage, it does not mean that I'm saying markets are easy to beat. Yep. But you will never convince me that markets can't be beaten. Uh, and there are definite ways of measuring, assessing, and inferring in particular that other participants in the market, in aggregate, are too fearful or too greedy. And if you have the intestinal fortitude to take a contrary position to that, it does work over time. How many people have you come across, investors have you come across, portfolio managers, that believe that markets are efficient? Very few. Lots Very of few. academics, not many practitioners. Well, to be honest, uh, a practitioner who believed in the efficient market hypothesis is conducting an unethical business because he shouldn't be an active manager. Obviously, the ETF providers do believe or will have their clients believe that markets are efficient. That's a different matter. The, the only other thing that we've got to take into consideration as well is that many of the ETF providers provide fundamental ETFs today. So quite frankly, as a, as a product provider, they provide you with the ability to own the market. But then on the back end of that, they confidentially you know, provide you with a way to, in order to become a fundamental ETF owner as well. The, hence, there's a quantitative screen that yeah. kind of you know, predisposes certain stocks to be or assets to be in one ETF and not in, the, in, in, in another one. The, the bigger question for me in that state is how do you actually wrap up all these things and actually make sense, you know, sense of them from a portfolio construction perspective, which is a completely better okay. again on its So on then its, tell us, its, how, its, how do you? I mean, because during the crisis, we uh, saw a lot of people moving towards the ETF market because they uh, were very disappointed at the skills uh, during the crisis time, and a lot of people lost quite a bit of money. And therefore, we did see the deterioration in sentiment. And this is why ETFs are doing well. You see, I want to come back to what Rowan said just now. And Rowan said that there are... We, we, it's going to be difficult to, be con to convince that you can't actually beat the market. And I want to, I want to agree with that, okay? because there are great managers out there that through time actually do beat the market. But there are specific cycles that favor them, and there are certain cycles that don't favor them. So a classic example would have been 2007, when the PE started going into the high multiple type levels, where you said the Anglo-American was sitting up at 25 PEs, and Billiton was sitting up at 28 type PEs. And very, very difficult to beat this market because valuation has turned against you. But if you're prepared to stick it out with that specific fund manager, when the cycle turns, you're going to be making back a lot of the returns that you've missed out because the valuation was against you. So again, it comes back to philosophy and what do you believe in as, ac as, an, actual, as an actual investor. Roland, let me ask you this then. Uh, with regards to, uh, if we say that the markets are efficient, it seems that we're using the S&P and the Dow Jones and the All Share Index to, to show whether the market is efficient or not. Tell us about benchmarks and whether it is the right benchmark to use. Well, that, that's a very important topic because um, I'm going to actually use the research done by uh, Farmer and French who wrote the, uh, or Eugene Farmer at least, wrote the original uh, efficient market hypothesis. But um, they have subsequently s uh, continued to say markets are efficient, but they've broken down the market into different risk categories. And they're saying that within the market, there are sources of excess return that require no skill to, to outperform. So value investing, in other words, buying cheap shares, low PE, high dividend yield paying stocks, will give you a premium over the market. You don't need to be skillful to do that. In fact, we have indices that capture that kind of thing. Small caps and the momentum effects are all within equities or within the, the, the benchmark that we use to measure market efficiency, uh, uh, parts of the market that outperform consistently in the long run. So I would say that the market is not the best way to measure whether markets are efficient. You've got to break it down into the risks within the market. Okay, so you're saying the risk is a better benchmark to extrapolate whether the market is A risk-adjusted benchmark is a much better way to measure whether things are efficient Ryan, or not. do you agree with that? Well, I think the science has improved in, in developing these new modern benchmarks, risk-adjusted benchmarks that uh, Roland suggests. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid I, my position will still always be violently against ETFs and passive tracking. Um, I think that they will always be constituted from a fairly naive stock selection, a mechanical system. Uh, and there will be periods where mm -hmm. bottom-up analysts can see that there's an error. I mean, the, one of the most stunning ones in my career was uh, when the implied value of the entire diamond business of De Beers was negative. Mm. Um, now, would a mechanical process, how would it have, have treated that? I, I also want to throw in one other thing against ETFs. Um, I'm afraid uh, I won't win too many friends with this, but it's a, a parasitic industry. If, if everybody were to become ETF managers, the stock markets would uh, cease to function. 
those of us that actually go and try to discover fair price contribute uh, to the entire capitalist system, to capital raising and, and price discovery. And uh, ETF providers and their clients uh, contribute nothing to that process. It sounds fa very fascinating and therefore there wouldn't be a need for portfolio managers and asset managers and investors and the like essentially. So in other words we would see that uh, scenario playing out quite extensively. Do you see that happening? Do you think that we're on the path to do that? Because we see a lot, we've got a lot of ETFs on the market and especially if you see what uh, BlackRock is up to for example in the US, does that worry you? No, I think the, m the more the ETF market develops and takes up more and more of the market capitalization, the greater the propensity for us active managers to be able to, to outperform because fewer yeah. people will be looking at the fundamentals. Um, we'll have far fewer people concentrating on the true value and they're all sheepishly just following market mm -hmm. index, index uh, rules. Um, and I think life will get quite good for us active managers if ETFs grow more. Mm -hmm. one, of, one other thing about ETFs is of course they are provided only on this set of assets for which it is convenient for the ETF manufacturer to provide them. So you don't tend to find small cap growth ETFs, you find all Z40 ETFs or S&P 500 ETFs. They make themselves nice 9 to 5 jobs and don't contribute to proper price discovery. Wow, okay, that's quite strong. You see the other thing Thoughts as well, that I mean, to take into consideration here, is that potentially an uh, ETF market or a passive market, for instance, also creates maybe long-term opportunities for active managers. Because remember that many of these strategies reset themselves at very predetermined kind of intervals. And as they reset themselves, you know, potentially you are in a situation where you could potentially benefit from that, especially if you understand the quantitative rules by which mm -hmm. the ETFs kind of... Um, kind of, uh, kind of uh, you know, limit themselves and, and, and price themselves. Um, so, you know, all in all, I, my opinion is that long term, you know, the market is a free and open space. It comes down to investor psychology at the end of the day and the philosophy that an investor wants to, wants, you know, wants to adopt. And, so and you, understanding that one investor is not the same calculating machine as the other. Absolutely. They and that's what makes have, market though. Yes, but not just that in the economic sense, mm -hmm. they're seeing things differently. Uh, what one investor's reaction to the same set of news could be as rational as the others, as, uh, yet for his purpose, it's an entirely different circumstance. Mm. Not to say that one is wrong or the other is right. They're not I both see. being irrational or equally rational. rational. They're being rational within their circumstances. Okay, fantastic. We are going to uh, have to wrap this up, but just to wrap it up with you, Roland, last thoughts on where the markets well, are efficient or not. Bertrand Malkiel asked the question, um, if markets are inefficient and there are all these uh, exploitable opportunities, there must be $100 bills lying around everywhere for mm. people to pick up. Um, I don't know when you last found a hundred rand note lying around, but there are clearly not many of these things lying around. So if they are hard to find, then maybe markets are more efficient than we think they are.